Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. So, in accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting in a hybrid model, both virtually and in person. The Public Works Commission is conducting this meeting on November 9th, 2022, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Zoom platform and in person, in accordance with the town's policy directive and guidelines issued on April 1st, 2020, and amended on May 7th, 2020. I ask that all Public Works Commissioners, town staff, and presenters activate their video and mute their microphones unless they have something to say or are participating in the committee dialogue. For members of the public, when I open the meeting to public comment, in order to be recognized, please use the raise hand option in Zoom or the star nine by phone. If you are recognized, please state your name and address. This meeting is being recorded and will be available later for town for viewing on the town's website. <clears throat> so I, Andrea Solomon, hereby call this meeting to order. Uh, Jeff, oh, is, Jeff here. is here. Okay. If all so since we are not all in person, um, we will be taking votes via roll call. We'll start with an attendance roll call of commissioners. When I announce your name, please reply and state whether you are attending in person or remotely. Andrea Solomon is here. Jeff Fasser. Attending remotely. James Terry. Present in, in person. Sven Weber. In person. So we'll um, review and approve of minutes. Um, these are from October 12th, 2022, the Public Works Commission meeting. Do we have any comments? No comments? I move that we approve the minutes of October 12th, 2022. Second. All right, we'll take a roll call for approval. Andrea Solomon approves. Jeff Fasser? Yes. James Terry? Aye. Sven Weber? Aye. Our, our review of the calendar. Um, that's... Okay, A3. So for future meetings, including meeting dates, does that yeah. look good to everybody? The next meeting is on December 14th. Yep. Town meeting. Okay. So I will be away. Okay. And I will just state that um, we have, again, tentative schedules, uh, but uh, up and coming, we'll be doing town meeting. Uh, warrant article reviews. At this point, I'm not anticipating un anything unusual through Public Works, just as a heads up. We'll be doing a 2023 roads program uh, overview, uh, where engineering will provide us with uh, their uh, tentative plan of uh, priority locations and uh, uh, potential treatments. Uh, we will be having a uh, discussion on the scenic roads uh, regulation uh, review, uh, and that'll be a detailed discussion and deliberation. Uh, and that's what we know of. And if something comes up between now and then, we may add it to the, the uh, agenda. Otherwise, I think, you know, you just kind of read through it. It sort of projects out what we think we might be discussing that are you know, more routine items. You're not aware of anything on the special town meeting that affects public works. Uh, thank you for mentioning that, Jim. Yeah, the special town meeting is you know dealing with the primarily with the middle school, yeah. and there's nothing that I've seen citizen petitions or anything that's come where we would need to be sort of more engaged and just aware of the uh, middle school. Okay. Okay, all set for the calendar. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move on to uh, D1 middle school solar panel panel impact on. GCD. Okay, so that, this is one of those where we say we didn't anticipate. Uh, last Thursday, we got sort of a rush of a need for some discussion relating to a project with the solar panels that were being proposed at the middle school. It hadn't been identified in the uh, former discussion with the ground or conservancy district. It, could potentially affect the um, impervious cover, triggering a need for a recommendation from the Public Works Commission to the ZBA. As of last night, uh, the planning board uh, opted to clarify that they saw uh, that this project or phase is different than what they have in front of them 
Uh, the Public Works Commission has already weighed in on the stormwater and pervious cover issue, so there will not be a discussion tonight. There was going to be a presentation more detailed, but they've sort of, uh, as of last night, determined that no, they weren't going to combine these. They're actually two different um, um, project champions, and uh, I think there will be a, an opportunity a future meeting to have that discussion. So it'll come back to the table. We just found that out today. So okay. we can move move beyond that that topic. And, but just the, yes. the sponsor is is this um, um, municipal, municipal light or is it the school district? I believe or? it's the municipal light. Yeah. But that was part of the part of the question even coming in today. Sort of who is the champion? I, yeah. And uh, they both have an interest. I believe the municipal light plan is the, will be the sponsor. Okay. Okay. That's easy. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll move on to D2 winter maintenance presentation. So that said, I'm going to ask Aaron McClosco, Highway Ground Superintendent, to come forward. I'm going to, while he's coming forward, I'm going to uh, share my screen and hopefully bring up a uh, winter maintenance. Uh, let's see. And I think, I don't know if I can minimize this, but I think you can kind of see uh, for the most part the uh, uh, presentation. So Aaron, if you want to take the lead and walk us through. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you just zoom out one click on the um, slide? Zoom out like that. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Good evening, everyone. Aaron McClosco, Highway and Ground Superintendent. Um, thank you for allow me to have the opportunity to present on our winter maintenance program for Concord Public Works. Um, it's my, I think, fourth year of giving the presentation. So uh, it's a lot of uh, similar information to previous years, but kind of highlight some changes and feel free to ask any questions as, as gonna, we go along here. Um, so I'll start with the Public Works and Public Works Commission policy. Um, uh, the, the policy for, is for the department and the commission, we want to maintain a level of service that keeps the concrete street system, which includes sidewalks, parking lots, uh, passable and safe for pedestrians and vehicular traffic, especially for emergency vehicles such as police, fire, ambulance, or any other vital services as much of the time as possible within the limitations imposed by extremes of nature and the resources available. That kind of, you know, it's a general statement, but really it emphasizes the fact that we do our best with the situation, um, depending on the situation with the weather, every storm is different. There's different impacts to the community. Um, we have uh, a number of services that the town provides um, and we wanna prioritize public safety uh, being that. Um, we try to do uh, the best we can to um, remove as much of the, the snow and ice from the roadway as possible, as quickly as possible during the storm, as safe as, as we can do that. Um, and every storm is different, so duration of the storm, um, response time um, are all, all kind of vary depending on the situation at hand. So that's kind of a general statement that kind of covers, uh, covers that. Uh, our priorities, uh, public safety, employee safety. Um, efficiency, fiscal responsibility, sustainability. I'll talk a little bit about how we, um, you know, meet those and have those prioritized. Um, a big thing the, to note is that typically we're going out on the roads, maintain the roads when, you know, the governor or other local officials are saying, stay home. Uh, so a big thing for me is, is our employee safety and making sure that everyone that works for the town, whether an employee or contractor out in those hazardous conditions, operating heavy machinery and equipment is as safe as possible um, all the time. What we maintain, we maintain uh, over 107 miles of roadway, uh, four miles of private roads, 44 miles of sidewalk, and 12 parking lots around town. So, Stephen, overview. Um, so, last year, our first event was December 8th, um, and it was uh, just a trace amount. It was a freeze up. Uh, we responded for about eight and a half hours uh, during that event, DEI scene. So we applied uh, liquid brine application and about 150 tons of, of uh, road salt, um, partial deployment, which is, is basically just all of our employees. We didn't have any contractors come in and that event cost us just over $16,000. Largest event of the year, largest accumulation uh, occurred. And it was a two day event. Um, January 29th to the 20 uh, into the 30th of 2022, 18 inches of snow accumulation, um, about over 45 hours uh, duration event, uh, de-icing, so about 200 tons of salt, and um, it was a plowing operation uh, as well, 
Um, following the storm, we had a uh, snow removal operation. I'll go into details of what that what that is. Uh, a few slides. Um, we had two of those uh, during the season, and it was a full deployment. So over fee, about 50 pieces of equipment, 40 pieces of equipment on the roads, town employees and contractors. The cost of that one event was $117,000 uh, in change. Uh, and our final event uh, was kind of early in the season, uh, March 12th, um, another uh, de-icing event, five-hour operation, about 190 pounds of salt, um, and just employees responded just over $15,000 for that one event. Some of the data. Um, Winter maintenance responses, we have 31 total responses. Uh, we just don't respond when it snows. We're also doing a lot of overnight de-icing operations. Uh, temperatures fluctuate from the day to night. And a lot of times, uh, if there's moisture on the roadway, uh, that could be you know just wet pavement during the day, it freezes up at night. We have to come in and make sure um, the roads are safe, uh, uh, free of ice, because people are traveling on the roads you know, 24 hours a day. Um, this is a cut through kind of community. Um, and we have a lot of traffic uh, throughout the day and we want to make sure the roads are safe at all times. Uh, we had put two snow removal events where we removed snow from downtown uh, Concord Center, West Concord, the Road Depot. Uh, total cum accumulation for last year uh, was kind of on the lower end, uh, about 45 and a half inches of snow. Um, total staff hours, uh, 4,782 staff hours, 921 contracted uh, labor hours. Um, roadway applications, we used uh, 4,566 tons of road salt, applied uh, 10,200 gallons of liquid brine application of the roads and uh, total expenditures for labor, uh, contracted labor and supplies and equipment, uh, 841,405. <clears throat> so uh, kind of an overview, things I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna talk about kind of employee training, procurement, communication, safety. Um, in our operations, uh, kind of route optimization, tracking, forecasting, uh, our strategies, uh, talk about our fleet maintenance, what goes into that, and different types of plowing and uh, treatment techniques as well. So our planning for winter maintenance starts in the summertime. So we're always thinking, well, you know, one, two seasons ahead. Uh, once our budget gets approved at town meeting, we start our fiscal year. Uh, we start looking at, you know, procuring equipment, materials, supplies. Uh, we have agreements that we enter into, uh, for example, uh, we use the state contract um, to procure road salt, get the best price that we can. Um, prices have escalated significantly over the last few years. So we lock into that contract. We've let the state know uh, our anticipated usage for that year and what type of salt we would like. Um, that happens early on. We also have uh, an agreement with the uh, yeah. Department of Corrections to use part of their property in West Concord as a snow dump. So we have to enter into that early in the season as well to make sure we secure that property because um, without it, uh, we wouldn't have anywhere to store snow in West Concord. Um, we're also looking at equipment. There's a lot of supply chain issues right now for everything. I think everyone's experiencing that. So we're ordering, you know, blades and nuts and bolts and different parts we might need. Um, as soon as the money's available from the budget, uh, we just have to start placing our orders or putting purchase orders, um, that kind of thing. We want to secure our contract labor. So we have a number of contractors that work for us. We have a contract. We update our rates every year. Um, to try to get in line with mass DOT standards and other communities in our area, comparable communities. So we're adjusting rates, locking in those contractors early to make sure we secure those resources for the town of Concord. Um, we are looking at uh, route optimization. We go back one out. Okay. Um, so we're looking at kind of route optimization. Um, we have 18 plus routes in town right now. Um, we have some ABC routes we split up. We look at all the routes, the efficiencies, anything that might have changed. There could have been a construction project, could be a new street that we, uh, the town has accepted and looking into that. Um, we are marking out hazards. There might be uh, somebody left a basketball hoop out in the road. So we want to make sure we notify the, the homeowner with a door tag, please remove the basketball hoop from the right of way so it doesn't get damaged. Um, any type of changes, we, we're looking for those. Um, and then a lot of multi-department coordination. So we're working with CMLP because usually there's snowstorms, it's ice storms, there's wind, trees are coming down, wires are coming down. We're working with them to you know make sure we're on the same page and we have plans. Um, we also have CMLP employees that work with us um, in plow. Uh, we don't have enough operators to, to staff our routes. So uh, they work with us and, and join our team uh, as well. So we wanna make sure that those employees are available. And then we also uh, encourage employees to attend trainings. So we work with organizations like UMass, um, uh, Bay State Roads training courses to send employees to winter maintenance programs or American Public Works Association um, provides for winter maintenance training for our employees as well. 
And we have an all hands meeting in October 26th every year to talk about this, the expectations. Everyone gets their route assignments and, and their route and driving their route following that meeting. Some of the planning that goes in. So the top left photo, that's our salt shed. The rear of the building, if anyone wants to drive around after the, after the meeting, take a look. It's stocked up, but tractor trailers will bring loads of salt, they'll dump it in the yard, and then we have to manually use our loader to, 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 to move that salt material into our covered storage area. We move all of our sanders that are stored offsite. That bottom left photo is the compost site located at 755 Walden Street. It's a multi-use facility for us, not just for compost operations, but we store a lot of our off-season equipment up there. It's a vital location for public works operations. This is a photo of the sander, stainless steel sander that we store on top of Jersey barriers. We're loading onto a truck to then it's then brought down to this facility for uh, preventive maintenance and inspection prior to use. How much salt do you have to store? Uh, right now we have about 200 tons. So for one big snow event? Or... Uh, so one snow event might like 150 tons of salt. Yeah. Uh, we anticipate using just about 4,000 tons of salt every year. That's kind of our average. That's what we tell MassDOT we're going to use our so refill on a regular basis. Correct. Then. Following every storm, we call and we order however many we've used. So we store inside the shed. We also have what we call uh, a backup break the glass. So we have a, hundreds of tons of salt stored outside of the shed underneath a large tarp. Okay. And so if we have a long duration event, let's say multiple days, yeah. 50 plus hours, you know, mixed precipitation, we're having to treat, treat, treat. We do not want to run out of salt. They will not deliver salt during the middle of the storm. So we have to make sure we have enough for those long duration events on hand. Yeah, that's one thing that we kind of struggle with with this facility, we're limited on space. So we have to be very uh, cognizant on how much salt we have on hand, what we're using, what we have on order, and making sure we're, we're managing that accordingly. Operations, oh, that's a team photo, we're in here uh, talking about snow and ice. Um, so our team, we have about 25 equipment operators, 16 contracted operators to come, that's with an employee and a piece of equipment. Um, we have one snow desk dispatcher and two administrative assistants in the office. So we, anytime we have a snow event, we staff a dispatch desk 24 hours a day. So if anybody has a question, concern, uh, you know, there might be a mailbox that was damaged or uh, a driveway that, um, you know, they have a concern of how, you know, uh, snow on their driveway after a storm, whatever it might be, uh, uh, they may need assistance. They can call and they, somebody from Public Works will answer the phone and then a supervisor will be dispatched to that location to, to speak with that resident and address their concern. Um, uh, that's, a, I think, a great thing that this town does, provides that extra level of customer service around the clock. Um, in the office, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of calls post-storm to the main office, so we have uh, folks that uh, are receiving those and addressing those. We have one fleet supervisor and one master mechanic. Right now, we're down a fleet supervisor, so we have uh, our master mechanic. Um, um, we're trying to, currently trying to fill that second, second uh, um, uh, position, vacancy, thank you. Um, so we're working on that. So we're down one mechanic right now. So we're paying very close attention to to how the shop is running. But um, our master mechanic, Stefan, I'm doing a great job uh, getting us through uh, this time right now. And we have three supervisors that are, are available during storms. Um, 22 plow routes. Um, we plow all public roads in the town of Concord. No state highways, so no Route 2 and not uh, Route 2A. Um, we also plow a number of private roads in town. Questions? Like what private roads? There's a list. Uh, back in 1964, there was a town meeting authorization um, that uh, allows the town to uh, spend um, general funding on uh, maintenance of private roads uh, that meet specific criteria. A number of criteria, uh, the big items in that list are their pre-1955 layout. There's a home every 500 feet and it's safe for the plow. Um, so most of the private roads that we do not maintain do not meet that pre-55 layout. Sidewalks and business districts and school areas. Like I said, over 44 miles of sidewalks. Um, we just received a new uh, sidewalk plowing machine. I got a, a photo of that in this presentation. Um, and uh, we have 13 de-icing routes that we, we de-ice the roads, sidewalks, and parking lots in town. So a little bit about our, our operations. So we're continuously monitoring the forecast. We have a customized weather forecast and service that we use in town. Um, and we'll get a forecast every morning at 2 a.m. Um, year round and then during snow events or high wind events we'll receive a detailed forecast that breaks it down into uh, hourly increments every six hours i believe we get that sent out to us it comes to all the supervisors and a number of key uh, uh individuals within the department in town so we can all see the forecast we print that out put it by the time clock so that all the staff know what to expect and can plan accordingly um 
We also have road weather information systems. Uh, this is our third year of using that that technology where we have remote devices um, installed out in the field. I'll go into in a, in a couple of slides. Um, uh, Pre-storm assessment. So we'll develop a response strategy. We're always talking snow during the winter time. And as we know, if storms coming, the more frequent the conversations happen um, and adjusting, people might be out sick, vacation, whatever it might be, equipment breakdown. We're constantly adjusting what our plan is. We want to make sure we communicate that with employees before the storm so everyone's on the same page. We do town-wide inspections. So we're always looking at ground, uh, ground surface temperatures, doing visual inspections on the roadways. Um, we want to make sure that we are keeping track of where equipment is, how it's operating, whether it's efficient or not, um, making sure it's working properly and not uh, breaking down. And if we have breakdowns, you know, we're able to repair the equipment quickly, get it back on the road, and to cover the routes if we have to take a truck off the road. And then communication is important. <clears throat> Constant communication between operators, snow desk, the supervisor. All our trucks have radios, so they communicate with each other via radio. And then we also can, can talk to public safety dispatch and um, um, talk to you know, speak with customers as they have issues that they want to bring forward. Couple photos. Um, top left is a skid steer clearing a bridge, uh, bridge deck. Uh, bottom left is a loader filling a sander here in the yard. Uh, Middle um, the bottom is a skid steer. I think it's Elm Street Bridge in the bridge deck. Like I said, during a, a storm situation, it's not just plowing, trees come down. So then we'll have to pull an operator out of the truck off the road, come back here, get the forestry truck with the chainsaws, go back out, clear the tree from the road, and then resume plowing operations. There's a lot of different things going on uh, during a snow event. And then uh, on the right uh, sidewalk plow. Um, fleet maintenance. Uh, fleet maintenance is critical. We have a lot of equipment. A lot of equipment requires a lot of maintenance. We have to make sure this isn't, uh, we have a very nice equipment. Town does a great job of supporting our, our, uh, our capital requests. Um, we try to keep the equipment in, in top condition and as clean as possible. So, um, our fleet includes some heavy duty trucks. There's the photos of them right there. So we have six trucks that have, uh, wing plows. It's a secondary plow off the side of the truck. So uh, we can, you know, plow basically instead of having to take four passes to plow a roadway, it's just two passes. So um, less time, less labor, uh, more efficient. Uh, some trucks have belly scrapers are kind of getting away from that. Um, uh, we have loaders, backhoes, salt spreaders with ground speed controllers. So what that does is it, it regulates the speed of the spreader based on the speed of the truck. So slower the truck's going, slows the spreader down. Faster the truck's going. We have an application rate standard of 250 pounds per lane mile. That's a DOT standard. We'll tune, turn it down a little bit as conditions allow. Um, and we calibrate all of our sanders every year. So we've had some of them done now. We're sending a, a couple employees to class next week to, to calibrate a, a couple more Bay State roads. And our mechanics will continually uh, look at the calibration. We're watching trucks. Okay? If we have a supervisor going down the street, we're watching the spreader, making sure it's working properly. If not, we'll call it off the road. Um, corrosion equipment. Uh, is um, a big issue on some of the trucks. Mind just going back. Oh, yeah. one, next. Um, we have a wash rack out back. So after a storm, we're washing all the trucks. Even if it's cold out, we have rain gear. Guys are out there, fire hoses. We're cleaning trucks, washing all the sand, sand out uh, or the salt out of the out of the spreaders. Um, making sure the trucks are clean is a big, important um, factor, in, in making sure we get the longevity out of these vehicles that the town's spending a lot of money on. Um, we're doing circle checks before and after the operation, and um, we have mechanics on duty during all of our operations. Next photo is a fleet size so F550 right there, the nine foot Fisher HC heavy commercial plow um, on the front um, of the wing truck on the top right, right there. It's an international. Uh, the bottom right is a brand new uh, sidewalk plow with the um, snowblower attachment. Um, that arrived a couple of months ago. It also came with a V plow and a power angle plow as well. Uh, middle bottom is a picture of our smaller brine truck that was actually fabbed up and, and made uh, by our employees here. Um, they set that truck up, which is uh, uh, a nice little truck that we have. So we have two brine trucks that we use. And then the bottom right left is uh, four of our sanders that we have. A number of our trucks have a swap loader. What that means, instead of just having a dump bed on the back of it, there's a hook, hydraulic hook, essentially a large hook that picks up the sander. And so we can swap bodies. So we can swap the sander body for a regular dump body or a flatbed body with a catch basin cleaner. So it makes, now one truck can be used for a number of operations. Um, so 
this is so this goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier about our roadway information system and our, our, our continuous monitoring. So this is a new technology. Uh, they used, it's used a lot out in Midwest, a lot on private properties. Uh, we are a couple of years ago, one of a few communities in Massachusetts that actually used it. Mass DOT has these all over their highways. Um, but this is a uh, real time monitoring of uh, roadway conditions. And essentially we can get real data such as road temperature, air temperature, uh, humidity. We get a live photo um, and we're able to monitor all that data remotely. So instead of having to be out there on the road physically looking at it with a, uh, a surface temperature gauge in your hand or a road temperature uh, unit mounted to the truck, you can be, I could be in the office, I could be at home, I could be anywhere. And I can share that data with anyone and we can see. So it allows us to kind of better monitor um, and plan our operation. And really, we might have a situation where, you know, the air temperature is down at 30 degrees, but it was warm all day and the road temperatures are still at 36 degrees. So roads aren't freezing. So I know I don't have to send out the salt trucks and salt the entire town and spend twelve to $15,000 plus all, you know, all the environmental impacts that come with that and we can make a better decision, right? On the flip side, I can also, for floating that line, and I know that hey, it's gonna be, uh, I can see that the trend is, is, is in the decline, it's gonna freeze up. I can make sure we're you know, uh, de-icing the roads at the appropriate time to make sure they're as safe as possible. So it's a great technology, great tool, especially in a town like Concord where we're this size and we have different elevations and different conditions. You have some heavily forested roads uh, with this heavy tree canopy, and you have some roads that are wide open. We also have areas like a nurse knack hill where it could be snowing up at a nurse knack hill while it's raining down here at the cpw complex and i know i can send a truck up there to treat that's the only place i have to treat at that time so um it's a great technology um it's a reasonable cost and it's this is the third year we're, we're using it um we're changing to a new vendor this year just based on um kind of procurement and um some of the technologies that they offered but um it's i think it's a great tool do you have enough so last year we had five. This year I'm trying to put seven up. So I think I think we do. Um, so it's not equipment that you own. It's equipment that you rent for the season. Correct. So it's a lease. So we'll be leasing seven units. Okay. And they uh, we do they send us the units. We do the installation, the standalone. So they have a battery pack. They run off a cell network. Okay. Um, and they provide the lease includes maintenance. So if we have an issue or we need uh, um, the IT assistance, they're able to to help us. Thanks. So uh, plowing and treatment. So we have different responses. So every every storm is different, and how we approach maintenance of the roadways depends on a number of conditions: the timing of the day, uh, the forecast, the temperatures, the amount of accumulation, the type of accumulation. Essentially, in general, um, we'll do we'll pre-treat the roads. That prevents uh, kind of hard pack from building up. So what that means is we'll either, if there's no anticipated precipitation, we we'll apply a salt brine, liquid salt brine solution to the town, uh, to the roadways in town, or we'll apply a road salt. Um, uh, and then as we see accumulation, um, as motor vehicles travel through that free treated, um, those roadways, the salt will mix into the, into the snow, it'll melt. Um, and then eventually, if there's enough accumulation, we'll have to go into plowing operation. Uh, generally, about two to three inches, we'll start plowing roadways and we'll plow until um, the snow stops. And then we'll also treat again to make sure um, it doesn't freeze up um, unless it's, you know, it's anticipated to be temperatures uh, are, you know, climbing post the storm. We'll typically do a treatment following a, uh, a snow event. We also plow all the sidewalks at the same time, generally, that we start plowing the roadways. Um, so we have three sidewalk machines out when we have all the plow trucks out. We're also plowing and hauling snow and removing snow from all the public parking lots in town as well. Anytime we go into a plowing operation. Um, following a, 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 uh, a plowing operation, well, we'll once employees start finishing their plow routes, we'll have them come back to the yard, get some different equipment. And then what we'll also do is we'll go out and clear all the curb ramps. Um, you know. Nothing's worse than you have a nice plowed roadway, nice plowed sidewalk, you get to an intersection, you have to climb over a snowbank. Mm -hmm. So we work really hard uh, and it's a lot of extra work yeah. after, you know, if you think about these long duration storms, we have operators plowing 30 hours, now they get out of the truck and they got to manually shovel. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot of effort. Appreciate the hard work of the team. Uh, they do a great job, um, but that's one thing we'll, we'll, we, we strive to do is to try to clear all those curb ramps. So it's safe. A lot, of, a lot of people like to get out, Rick, you know, get out of their house after a long storm. They've been cooped up. They want to walk down the street, walk down downtown. And we want to make sure it's as accessible as possible for everybody to do that. So,
Um, so we do snow removal downtown. We call business district snow removal. So following an operation, um, you know, with conversations with Alan, the town manager, um, looking at the time of year, the forecast uh, over the next few days, we'll do a downtown snow removal operation. We'll actually remove all the snow that's built up in the wind roll, like on the curb line, basically the meter line, downtown and West Concord and Thoreau, um, on Thoreau in the business area. Uh, it's an overnight operation. Typically costs about $15,000 to run that operation. Essentially, we'll take all the snow that's on the curb, scoop it to the middle of the road, and then load it into trucks with loaders. Um, it's, it's quite the operation if you've never seen it. Um, and it's something that I think the businesses and the, uh, um, the, the folks that, that visit the, the downtown businesses and want to do the sh you know, shopping in the, in the, uh, the holiday season um, appreciate. And it's something that uh, I think the town does a really good job of, of, of providing that, that service for the town. So last year we ran it two times. Um, and it really depends on the amount of snow that was accumulated, you know, what the temperatures are going to be falling in the storm. If it's going to be temperatures are increasing and it's the end of March and all the snow makes be gone in a day, we might not spend the money. But if it's the week before Christmas, we're going to probably spend the money and clear the snow so that the shoppers can get out and, and visit those businesses without having to climb over a snowbank when they're exiting their vehicle. So um, snow storage, we have two storage facilities. So we're hauling snow during that overnight operation. We also haul snow, like I mentioned, out of all parking lots. So we have two storage locations. The Walden Street uh, compost site um, is a snow dump, as well as there's a large area behind the administrative building on Com Ave at DOC, and that's the second snow dump. So we're constantly hauling snow to those two locations. Uh, we will also plow snow from Doug White Field and Memorial Field as needed, depending on events um, that, and the use uh, uh, on those fields over the winter. So we work closely with the school department and recreation, and if they need them for winter athletics or a game or anything. Um, we have specialty equipment and highly trained operators that are very careful and able to plow that those those artificial turf fields. So it's a nice thing about having the two artificial turf fields in town is that you know those can be used year round um, when plowed. Uh, and then hydrant uh, hydrant plowing um, or cleanup hydrants. You know we're we're close with the departments. It's usually uh, handled by. Uh, fire department or, or water and sewer post storm as well. When you remove the snow for the school fields, is this charged to the uh, school district? Or? So Doug White Field is a, is a town field that we maintain year round, so that's not charged. Um, we don't necessarily charge the school for, for the time during the day. If it's an overtime operation or something outside of the normal working hours, which it's usually not, we'll work closely with them. Um, but usually they'll have some employees there too to work with us, so it's kind of a team effort. Mm -hmm. But we do charge that uh, the, the the school department they'll come down and they use this the salt from our salt shed and we track that closely and we do charge them for that. Um, and then this slide is a, a few photos of the operation. So the top left is the one of the fields, Memorial Field, after it was plowed. Uh, the middle one is what it looked like before. So um, it's quite a difference. And the other three uh, are downtown snow removal operations. So you can see the top left is, is the sidewalk plow as it runs down the curb line, kind of wind rolling the snow out into the roadway. Um, the bottom right is a loader, kind of taking all that snow, loading it into a dump truck. The bottom left is what it's going to look like the next morning. Very thorough, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say, uh, when I moved here uh, and had my first winter, I was super impressed. By, by the snow work you're doing here. It's, it's a great job. Thanks. And, yep. And I see, I live right there, the Zero <clears throat> District, and I see these kind of overnight removals of all the snow. It's it's impressive. It, yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great operation. We've got a great, great crew, really hard working group. So the pride as well as what they do. So thanks. Is there anything you're saying is unique? Is there anything missing or? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, for us, it's, 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 it's the two biggest things are, are staff and equipment. Um, we have a lot of new employees that work in the train. Um, and we have a lot of employees that are, um, you know, we've been here for a number of years and have a lot of training. So it's passing that knowledge on. Um, we have a couple of vacancies. We've had vacancies um, for a number of years and trying to bring on skilled seasoned employees is, is a tough thing to do. Um, so we're always looking for uh, experienced snowplow operators. Um, the second thing is the equipment. 
obviously, you know, you see our ask you know, presented, I think, the last meeting um, for our capital equipment uh, replacement. Um, if we don't have the equipment, then we, we can't do the work. So and what is in the ask is enough from your perspective. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a reasonable, like we, we spent a lot of time on going through our capital plan. So the five year, I put together a five year capital plan for the town. Um, in that, um, you know, we're trying to target our, our, our replacement as close to our um, prescribed replacement plan as possible. It's pretty fiscally conservative. It's, uh, you know, we try to extend the life beyond APWA standards and government standards. Um, you know, if we're able to hit the five, five year plan that I put out there, we'll be back on track. Um, we are behind as of right now, but we can't ask for everything the first year. So, um, and also, it, what what another thing that we're experiencing right now with procurement of vehicles, <clears throat> the vehicles that got approved last year that I ordered uh, over a year ago are still almost a year out from being manufacturing and receiving. So, when we're ordering vehicles, I know that I'm not going to get them for a year plus. Right, I'm, the vehicles that we get approved in May get ordered in July, and we won't see them until the next July. So, it's you know a lot of that planning and that shuffling. Um, and a lot of these vehicles that are used for plowing operations that get exposed to the elements, to the salt, you know, they do corrode. And some trucks and vehicles come out of service just because of, um, you know, they physically fail before the mechanic would fail, if you will. So given we are extending the life of the equipment <clears throat> over and above these standards, is there any liability exposure for, for us um, if something happens with overextended equipment or... Well, all the equipment is it, it's inspected every year. Okay. So all of our equipment every summer we have the state inspections. So they're all they're all registered inspected vehicles. If equipment does fail inspection, we take it out of service. Like right now, we do have a number of vehicles that we've taken out of service and are waiting for to be replaced. So they don't pass a state inspection. We don't put them on the road, and they come out of service, and we adjust our plan accordingly. I think it's important to understand what we want to communicate is the snow program is very well thought out. Mm -hmm. um, it's very deliberate. Um, there's a lot of coordination and thought that goes into it using technology, like Aaron mentioned, with the ability to monitor remotely conditions, saves thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of response. And we didn't have that capability just until recently. Um, and the other you know, interest is that we, um, we know we have you know, resource challenges, but we third party, you know, some of the, you know, snow response and, you know, being competitive and, and you'll see out in the roads, you know, plow drivers want yes, different yeah. communities really, you know, challenged. And so that's something which Aaron kind of keeps a close tab on so we can assure we have um, the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think the one issue for the uh, Public Works Commission to be mindful of is the sidewalk uh, policy that we have established. It's been established very deliberately because we need to be fair, equitable, and transparent as far as what we do and what we don't do. And so it's a fairly well-established you know, program. There are limits to it. We routinely will get you know, questions or asks in the mid-winter, mid you know, why aren't you doing this? Or we'd like you to do this and we want to come to the Public Works Commission. We have what we need for the level of service we can provide, but if we change the service demands, we're going to need more resources. And that's always, we're, we're at capacity and it ebbs and flows. But the real challenge is when we have the big storms, you got to sustain this response for you know, 24, 48, you know, 72 hours. And then you'll have, well, what about the downtown areas? Well, it's the same people who have been literally working around the clock and we have to build in some, some break time too. So, um, and, and one of the things you'll hear about uh, when we talk about capital budget for the town is the uh, needs for this campus. One of the things that's unusual is the lack of, re of, of, um, um, of room and space for these people who are, are literally living here. And you know, I don't just say that they may have a modest kitchenette, but that's it. And the break area is basically garage space and, you know, uh, cots that they may have to, you know, put out just to kind of camp. It's, it's pretty rudimentary. Um, we've been living with this for quite some time, but those are some of the things you would probably look at if we're re, when we retool this campus. So those are some of the things just to be aware of, but otherwise, 
is sort of ongoing. Um, it's nice, you know, we haven't had the storms in the middle of it. People get tired, they get cranky, and, you know, we just continue to just kind of press on, so. So, Ellen, you just touched on a couple of the questions I was gonna ask. Mm -hmm. One is the sidewalk policy. Mm -hmm. Can we put that on the website so that it's available, so that you can point to it? I mean, we have it, but as you as you mentioned, people ask about it because they don't know it or don't understand it. So, and I thought it was well written. Yeah, I mean, it was in the packet yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. And so, if there's some way, if, you know, in the winter winter program mm -hmm. to put it someplace that it's could more be, visible, or more visible for yeah, people. Right, yes, right. That, that would be that would be good. Okay. And the second thing I was going to talk about was the sleeping facility, because I know last year, I'm pretty sure it was last year, that you knew a storm was going to come like at two in the morning, and that you wanted to get the staff here before then, and you really don't have much for them to be able to sit and rest or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And so do you have space, but not equipment, or do you not even have space? Presently, we don't have space. Okay, so so there isn't a solution until we work on the campus. Correct. Okay. Um, and one question for Aaron: you, you talked about radios for all of the staff vehicles. What about the contractor vehicles? Uh, how can you? How do you communicate with them? So they have phones. Okay. They have phones. We don't have. We don't have currently have uh, enough radios to give to every contractor. So a lot of the contractors that work. The same company have radio communication, and we have the supervisor's phone number, and we call the supervisor. Okay. So, so, so you have a way to correct to go about that. absolutely. Okay. And then one final question: Last year, we got a complaint from a Lexington Road resident when we were doing the snow, the sidewalk plowing, and it, it knocked off some some boulders that were on the wall or whatever. That's probably in the public right of way. Yeah, so, 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 so yes, that it's really not our responsibility. It, I mean, yeah, so the sidewalks, so a lot of the sidewalks are very old, there's varying conditions and widths of the sidewalk. So, it is a very sensitive subject for um, some residents in town, depending yeah. on, um, you know, we have sidewalks that are asphalt, concrete, stone dust. Um, some want them to plow us to plow them, some don't want us to plow them, but we follow the policy. In that situation, election it is very narrow. Uh, the stone wall is right there, and when there's feet of snow on the sidewalk, it is impossible to differentiate between a snow bank and a stone wall. So those kind of things happen. Anytime there is damage, um, this, and the policy touches on it a, a bit, if there's damage to to um, property, we will go out and maintain it and, and repair it in the springtime. If we wrap up a lawn, we'll go back and reseed it and loam it in the fall. Or, I mean, in the spring, excuse me, if we have damage a mailbox, we have a mailbox replacement policy. Um, residents will go out and put a standard box and post back in, or we'll provide reimbursement up to forty dollars with proof of uh, a cost um, for replacement for a, a decorative a decorative one. The stone wall, that specific one, has come up multiple times, multiple seasons in a row. Um, we tried. I, I've, I've spoken to that resident a few different seasons, and it's a it's a tough situation right there. I would say uh, without going into too much detail. Okay. But, it's just the constraints, site constraints of yeah. how much the width of the sidewalk, whole stone wall, that, the yeah. traffic, it just there's nowhere to put the snow. You know, navigate. we have a situation where, you know, the sidewalk it, uh, directly almost abuts the edge of the roadway. You have a truck trying to plow the snow, the same wind roll, the direction that the, the machine's trying to, to wind roll the snow off the sidewalk. It's a constant battle. And um, sometimes, you know, that does happen, but um, we, do work closely with every complaint that we got to to do address it following the storm. Thanks. The other common complaint for sidewalks are the um, the uh, thaw and freeze, thaw and freeze. Sidewalks aren't designed to drain during the winter, and you get the snow banks, which become sort of the dams, ice dams, and inevitably, as people walking and start driving, the roads will sort of you know sort of condition and with the, the salt on them but sidewalks can be just uh, literally an ebb and flow and you think you've got it it, it uh, thaws it refreezes mm -hmm. so it requires sort of this chronic attention and it's challenging uh, you know to say the least stone dust particularly because yeah. stone dust sidewalks like if it was, let's say it snows tomorrow the ground's not frozen 
So we yeah. can't necessarily plow a stone on the sidewalk because then we're ripping up all the stone dust. It's happened before. Um, so when they have those kind of situations, we have to, you know, communicate out to the residents that they may or may not have the sidewalk plowed. And, uh, it becomes a, a an interesting situation. So, so in this case, no action. This is just information. Yeah. No, I, just it was aware. a great presentation. Yeah. I mean, we got a lot Thank of information. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Yep. Thank you. Under D3, mm -hmm. the use wastewater permit update. Sure, come on up. Uh, Jeff Morosky, uh, water sewer superintendent, uh, is going to provide a little bit of an overview. We've talked a little bit about, or we've talked at length about wastewater capacity challenges and that sort of thing. Um, one of the potential relief valves we were looking for, we knew it was a, a reach, was um, we've gone through a uh, renewal of our permit for the uh, um, community wastewater treatment facility located off of um, uh, Bedford Street. Um, with that, uh, I think the commission expressed an interest in understanding a little bit more about the, the permit itself and maybe the uh, conditions that we were issued. You know, So I figured Jeff could give you a little bit of an overview um, of kind of where we stand with the uh, wastewater you know, treatment facility permit. I don't have the uh, nice slides that Aaron had, so I have to apologize. <laughs> well, it's probably we'll better to, we don't. We'll have to suffer through <laughs> listening to me. Um, I wanted to give a, a little bit of a high view um, understanding of the program and how it's regulated, and then more specific about this particular process that we're going through right now, and then highlight uh, the particular problem that's um, at the forefront for us. Uh, so starting at the beginning, um, water in wastewater is one of the most regulated divisions of um, public works and environmentally that's um, done through either U uh, US EPA or Mass DEP. On the wastewater side, it's the Federal Clean Water Act that's the enabling le legislation and it is uh, US EPA and Mass DEP that is the regulatory authorities under that. And the instrument that the regulatory authorities use is something called the NIPTES program, and that's the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program. Uh, through that program, the regulators issue out five-year permits to the regulated entities. Um, and I believe that Concord's most recent permit was issued in 2013, so we're already in an administratively continued permit. So it should have elapsed in 2018, and now we're four years deeper than what it should have gone. Um, at the beginning of this year, in January of 2022, uh, US EPA notified the regulated um, entities, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, that facilities deemed medium sized plants, which are plants that receive and treat and discharge between one MGD and five MGD, uh, 1 million gallons per day to 5 million gallons per day, that the regulators were seeking to um, grab all these permittees under the umbrella of something called the general permit. And that would capture up to 44 wastewater treatment facilities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So Concord was one of those 44 that would have qualified under this permit. So in, at that time, the uh, US EPA was issuing out draft general permit language and draft authorization language for review and comments by the public, by you know, the watershed groups, the regulated entities. We of course did review the documents and we did provide comments and it was a series of comments. It was a, a detailed uh, response, a thoughtful response. We provided a lot of su substantiation and past uh, efforts um, in particular pursuing the increase in the discharge limit. That's for quite a while now been kind of our biggest constraint and our biggest pinch point. Uh, it's something that's becoming an impediment for development. It was late in September, uh, September 28th, when US EPA issued out their final discharge, uh, excuse me, their final NIPTES general permit. So it was issu issued out at that time as final. 
in addition to the permit coming out final, they did submit also the responses to questions, which included responses to Concord's comments and questions. Uh, that permit actually became uh, became effective on November 1st. However, we're not regulated under it until we actually enter into the general permit. And to enter into the general permit, we actually have to submit a notice of intent to the regulators. And there's a deadline by which we have to do that. And that's December 1st. Once we send that out and the uh, regulatory authorities, EPA, uh, MSDP, they would issue out to us an authorization to discharge. So we don't have a hard date by which we have to start complying to this general permit. It won't be until we receive the authorization to discharge. So that's a, an indeterminate date, um, but we do need to send out the NOI by or before December 1st. Um, biggest issue, as I mentioned before, is the capacity. Um, that was our first and foremost uh, comment. We were seeking to receive a, a modest increase in our current flow, and that is 1.2 MGD rolling average, 12 month roll, rolling average, excuse me. And the regulatory authorities did um, acknowledge that comment uh, for what that's worth, but their joint position, EPAs and DEPs, was that the town had yet to provide the necessary information in order to justify the increase of treated effluent, increasing it up from the 1.2 MGD. Now what they're, they, the regulators are calling for is that the town would need to provide with such a request an anti-degradation analysis. And just since I introduced that term, I'll give you a little bit of insight into what that is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, seemed appropriate. Uh, Anti-degradation requirement, this requirement um, or this requires that requests for granting flow increases must meet water quality standards. And to that point, to satisfactorily demonstrate this to EPA and MassDEP, such an increase must be accompanied by an evidence-based demonstration that an increase in discharge of pollutants or combinations of pollutants will not cause a violation of the water quality standards. And that includes uh, toxics. Fully protecting the existing uses and that means of the receiving water body that we're discharging to. In this case, it's the Concord River where the treatment facility discharges to. So in order to obtain a wastewater effluent flow increase, an applicant must make a satisfactory showing under the Commonwealth's anti-degradation implementation procedures. And that's within the state regulation 314 CMR4 and MassDEP's implementation procedures for anti-degradation provisions. This is a mouthful. And, of, excuse me, of the Massachusetts surface water quality standards. So as I mentioned, it's all under 314 CMR4 in, that regulation is the Massachusetts Surface Water Quality Standards. So, I, can you translate that? So, what do we need to do? Well, I, I was kind of getting to that. And it's actually, we'll talk about it just a little bit okay. more in the draft budget, but I want to um, highlight this at this point. Basically, we need to do a study that will demonstrate that. Um, the increase in flow will not cause adverse impacts to the receiving body. And to, to that end, we've built into the um, FY24 capital budget a um, fee, excuse me, a, a budget allotment of up to $150,000 for support services to conduct this study. Uh, so that, that falls under the capital budget under the wastewater treatment plant capacity slash optimization line item. So aside from that, the, the new permit does introduce some new things, um, new, new monitoring and reporting of influent characteristics, monitoring and reporting of uh, upstream background characteristics of the river. There's a lot of uh, data acquisition that's built into this permit that was put in there by the regulators and they'll end up using this information in future successive NIPTES permits, and it, it could lead to uh, new requirements 
new discharge requirements and future permits. Uh, but when we considered um, what the recourse would be, um, we could appeal to not be included within this general permit, but there's a chance that the regulatory authorities wouldn't allow us to not be a part of it. Uh, generally speaking, we're all in the same boat with other with all the other regulated um, entities, uh, wastewater treatment facilities within the Commonwealth. There were provisions here that um, were beneficial, including the uh, aluminum requirement that was by virtue of EPA accepting Massachusetts water quality standards from 2021. Uh, so we were opting to um, choose to participate in this general permit and we will be submitting out our NOI by or before December 1st for this program. Is there anything I didn't touch on, Alan? Yeah, I just wanna go back to Sven's question. What does it mean? And there's a lot of regulatory red tape involved. There is legal red tape involved. In fact, with the comments that we submitted, um, the response from EPA, they've done this for their convenience because they're backlogged with permits. <laughs> and every individual permit is more work. Yeah. They don't have the staff to do it. So they've lumped us into the general permit, but we've seen all the comments from the other 44 systems, which is helpful and kind of enlightening. This issue with capacity seems to be exclusively Concord's right now. I imagine it's going to eventually affect these other systems because we're talking about relatively small facilities. One to 5 million gallons is not huge. And regrettably, and I've mentioned this before, but Concord made some very important decisions back in the 70s of not, when there was lots of interest when the Clean Water Act was you know, passed and then there was state and federal money for treatment facilities. The, the, at the time it was, we want to right size our treatment facility. We don't want to plan for the future. It's that fear of if you build it, they will come. We've been living with that decision where we've been working within a, a, a permitted capacity, which is low for our size you know, community. Most communities aren't running into this cap. And so the problem now is the regulatory constraints of you know, higher and better treatment have just been ratcheted up. And in fact, the whole idea of the anti-degradation is they're now talking about emerging contaminants. Yeah. And they reference you know, treatment technologies they acknowledge don't exist today. So the problem becomes, are we literally, you know, we feel a bit like we're going, you know, we're in the Wizard of Oz, where every time we go, it's now go get this, go get, we've made a very important ask We've done a lot of assessment of some of the community needs and interests. We think we're going to need to do something more than just anti-degradation. We think we need to dovetail that with our integrated planning so that we can potentially make a case, not just to the regulators, but to the water, to the environmental watershed groups, that Concord needs to move forward, but we can't be you know, hogtied and not have the capability a meeting, you know, our planning, you know, our uh, housing production plan interests or zoning um, increases relating to transportation, MBTA, or, you know, potentially some of the areas that we have real, you know, challenges like the White Pond neighborhood. We really, we, we don't have a lot of flexibility. So we think we just have to do what we think is the right thing and hopefully get maybe an equivalent to um, offset to a flow and load at the you know, location of our treatment facility and maybe do some things that improve stormwater quality. We gotta be very creative. We think we can be, but some of that money that we've set aside to do some of the study is, it's difficult when you say, well, what's the impact of pharmaceuticals? What's the, you know, that we don't know yet. What about PFAS? You can throw a roadblock every which way you want. The reality is at some point we need to do something. You know, um, I think I've been asked to, to go to the select board meeting on Monday to talk about some of the constraints in wastewater. This is not something that Concord Public Works is engaged. We've worked really hard to try and do what we can within the bounds of the regulatory constraints. But, you know, the town of Concord 
I think with its political will and interest, as well as creative planning and maybe integrated approach, has to look at an alternative because you know, we've tried everything we can under the normal, you know, sort of um, what, what, you see, what was historically acceptable. But when you talked about anti-degradation in the past, you talked about nitrogen or phosphorus or BOD. These are contam contaminants that we can actually treat. But when you're talking about next level things, well, where does it end? And regrettably, it doesn't end with an increase in capacity at our existing facility, which is a which is a very sophisticated treatment facility. We can do great treatment there. Oh. The difference is groundwater discharges that don't have the same level of treatment that are not going to create the removal of these same, you know, parameters. So it's it's a bit of a you know conundrum. So what you're saying in a certain way is it was easier in the past, um, and we missed the boat as as a town to increase the capacity. Now it's getting more difficult to get the increase. It's never been easy, but it was almost yeah. achievable. Yeah, but it now it seems less achievable. But now. we can also yeah. probably assume it will yeah. be even more challenging going forward mm -hmm. in a few years from now. So thinking about, I don't know, the housing production plan and other things the town is doing. If we go through this process here and trying to get more, should we right from the get go even ask for more than just a moderate increase? Should we just so do we, a larger so step? Ben, we did in our um, comprehensive wastewater master plan and then a follow up to okay. that um, with Considering the, the original plan was a growth neutral plan. Yeah. Then it became, well, no, we need to accommodate some growth. So we, we identified areas of town that we should expand for environmental protection, not to increase yeah. anything. Then uh, in the uh, late 2000s, we decided, no, we need to make some consideration for economic growth and development. And at that point, we had a range of flows somewhere in the 300 to 600,000 gallons a day. If Concord had that, we'd, we'd be you know, successful for the next 20, 50 years. So at some point, you can't get that kind of flow. Yeah. And we're not interested in expanding you know, without you know, constraint. But right now, we have about 155,000 gallons we think we could permit for a groundwater discharge at the existing site. The problem is it's going to cost probably 4 or $5 million just at the site when we could treat to the same level and discharge out to the river at a fraction of that cost. And it's, you know, we need people to sit around the same table, look at the science and say, what are we doing here? And we don't wanna waste millions of dollars if it's simply to appease a regulation that really doesn't make sense. But if that's what we have to do, that may be our, you know, our only option. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just also going to add that what has been our long term plan and our roadmap was the comprehensive wastewater management plan and that's coming up on its 20th year. And that's really your typical planning window horizon for a document like that. I mentioned the anti degradation planning uh, uh, budgeting for a study. Under the same line item, we're also planning an allocation or a budget allocation for a update to the CWMP that will take us to the new the new horizon. So the, there's also those those are the two primary elements that are within that particular budget line in the draft budget. That'll take a couple of years and that takes significant community input and participation. When we did the first time, it was over 70 public meetings. With, with planning, public works, uh, Board of Health, NRC, all of the table. So it's a significant effort. Um, and we're trying to put it into the, the umbrella of an integrated plan where we also consider our drinking water issues and our stormwater issues. And it's, it's the right way to do it, but there isn't any real path forward yet on a regulatory process other than who started the dialogue. So, so I, I sense that you're, you're putting in your budget mm -hmm. funds for a study. Mm -hmm. But the study is going to, you know, is there any time frame when you have to get back to DEP as to 
Great question. No. So the permit will be um, uh, authorized and we will fall under the general permit. And they said at any time, you can always go and submit, you know, through uh, EEA, you know, a an update to your CWMP and make your case that you've done the anti-degradation assessment. We're not sure the anti-degradation independent of better understanding of drinking water and stormwater is the right approach. That's the old model. That's the only model that exists, but we're at a point where we have to be a little bit more creative than that. So it's just gonna take some time, but it won't hold us up from complying and sort of meeting the existing demands of the uh, discharge permit. And that's really what it, this is all about. The NIPBES is our control on you know, flow and load that we um, can handle at the facility. It was disappointing to get the response, but it's kind of textbook. But Jeff, in the memo that you sent to us on the back page, um, there are the first two items are, it says new. So do you have any idea the cost involved in preparing those reports? Uh, good question, and uh, I don't yet at this point. I, I'd have to uh, talk to, look into it a little bit more and get back to the commission on that. Okay. And then is there alternate power source? Move? And I, I, I guess my question is, what do we have? I, I, yeah. have, I have no idea what. So, so we do have presently, uh, this is to make sure that you have uh, emergency generation yeah. available. And there is an emergency generator that exists over the wastewater treatment plant. And the two pump stations? And two of the, the two pump stations. And it's a great question, Jim, because we're also looking at some of our lift stations where we look in, we anticipate probably needing to put emergency generation at those facilities as well. It all dovetails to kind of reliability of service and you know the, the risks um, and environmental risks, you know, if there's any uh, uh, failure. So we are in our budget, we'll sort a little bit ahead. Oh, okay. We will be talking about um, at some of the wastewater uh, facilities, the Bedford, uh, Old Bedford pump station, which serves a pretty large area, which we've had on the radar for emergency generation, we just haven't gotten to it. Now we're sort of prioritizing that. And I think we also talked about Park Lane as the other one. So. Uh, we'll probably put one in each year and then sort of just make progress. Uh, right now, what we do have is portable generators that we can uh, bring to each of the station. But the problem is if we have a significant outage and there's multiple stations, we just have crews rotating <laughs> around and, you know, well, it's been okay. You know, um, it's really not the long-term you know, plan. So some health and safety risks exposing staff to high high voltage three yeah. phase mm -hmm. power for the, the generator hookups mm -hmm. under adverse conditions usually it's not ideal conditions when you have a power outage usually it's a storm or some type of event like that or in the overnight is it safe to say that you're disappointed in what what has come about disappointed but not completely unexpected but I am saying we're going to continue to try something, which we're going to try and be creative. You know, I've already reached out to talk to the regulators about what we want to do. I've talked with some of the watershed you know, groups or specifically to partner, because what we're trying to do is responsible. That's all. And if we can get the right people around the table and try to come up with something which might be a little bit more creative than the standard siloed regulatory process, you know, if, if we can't do it in concrete, it can't be done. So, and I'm less disappointed in the community because I hear from the, why can't we just connect this to? So it's premature to talk about MCI. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it, all the alternatives we look at is what we're talking about as far as this next generation of what other, what, what alternatives are out there that we could contemplate and whether it's groundwater discharge, uh, you know, package treatment plants, um, combining with systems that exist, you know, like MCI, um, everything will be on the table. We should watch the select board meeting next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. You just heard the... <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> you, 
<laughs> they can yeah, tune in and they'll see and hear. And again, we're we're available to help them understand and the community understand the the, the dilemma we're in. So that's on the that's the NIPTES update. Unless you have any other specific, you know, basically we're we're fortunate to have staff like Jeff who really understand the nitty gritty. It's as he said, highly regulated. You know, water and and wastewater, and you got to pay attention to our our bosses are not just internal. You know, there's a lot of external bosses. So, thanks, Jeff. I don't think you want to leave. Oh yeah, because next is <laughs> enterprise budget planner. <laughs> Can't run away yet. Uh, so, yeah, and again, there was no action on that last item. And, and this is, again, information on our capital planning budget and sort of in sync with the rest of the town. Um, I'm going to try to be as you know brief as possible. There's a lot of meat on the bone in the, mm -hmm. and the memo that you received. I will tell you, it's very early this time around. Jim, you may be familiar, and Andrea, I don't know, in the past, well, since COVID, our schedules have been sort of a little wonky, but um, historically, we didn't uh, provide uh, enterprise capital budgets until January, February. And part of what is happening town-wide uh, through the FinCom and Town Manager's Office, is they really want to understand the larger needs of the community and dovetail sort of the long-term debt and those that might even require debt exclusion, you know, something beyond two and a half. So that's driving us to sort of put together, call together our capital plan. Um, it's a little rough right now, but um, kind of as we walk through, we wanted to hit some of the high level issues that we're paying attention to. Just the way we've broken this up is in essence consistent with the you know, kind of state um, finance uh, models of you know, various bins of assets. And you know, it sort of conforms with what the state's interested in seeing um, and the townhouse. Uh, but if we kind of walk through, and I will sort of make note, um, I don't know, uh, uh, Nelson uh, Moy, the management analyst for water sewer is also you know, kind of present, you know, depending on questions that may come up. Um, he's worked closely with Jeff and uh, Bob Hill as well to kind of help us kind of map out some of the larger investments. But, you know, I think I'll give a very, you, you can read some of the detail, and but I don't know if you have specific questions, but I'm going to just flag those things that are important and try and hit the highlights. Uh, the water main replacement schedule. Uh, we have uh, haven't had a water main replacement uh, recently, and we missed a cycle or two because of COVID and then supply side issues. We mentioned about the difficulty of getting the materials. So we did pre, uh, pre uh, uh, procure materials for work that's going to be done this, uh, this spring, we believe, in summer in the Butternut neighborhood. We also have an allowance for the, fo the following year where we're looking at the Silver Hill um, uh, road area where we're trying to dovetail with the um, engineering divisions roads program. So we base it on material of pipe, age of pipe, condition or history of breaks and that sort of thing. But we have 130 plus miles of pipe. We believe a life cycle of about 100 years on average. So we should be doing between a million and a million and a half gallons. Uh, miles of pipe a year. The budget, we're slowly increasing over the years to get to that. Um, we're not quite there, um, but uh, you'll see uh, in our five year to 10 year. So just to remind the commission, the town manager's office asked for a five year plan so they can see that radar. We historically do a 10 year plan and that sort of gets put together in a pro forma which allows us to get our capital, our operating expenses, our revenue projections, our debt schedules, all that gets baked into a financial performa that allows us to understand big picture, how are we doing as far as you know, fiscally. Um, it's unusual we do that because it's an enterprise. And when money gets collected, it can go into a fund that is dedicated for 
future investment. So that's why we can operate this way. Um, but water mains is going to be annually a fairly significant you know, line item. And that's you know kind of why. Basically, historically say about a, a mile per a million dollars, about a mile of pipe. That's changed. What are we finding now? Uh, prices have gone up about uh, 15 to 20% on a uh, per foot basis. And this particular um, budget line that's called out in this draft 24 budget, the project area Silver Hill is about 25% bigger than the Butternut neighborhood. Butternut neighborhood's about 4,000 feet of eight inch transite pipe. And this project is approximately uh, 5,500, I believe, linear feet of, again, eight inch transite pipe. So it is a, a larger scope project that was kind of earmarked in this in this proposed budget. So that's why for next year, it's 1.9 million and then you go down. Correct. Again. Exactly. But if he says, okay, if you go down fiscal year 25 to 1.1 million, another two year mark, we are still on the low end of of how much we should replace. Correct. But we but we are doing better than most. But we have to be sort of within reason. Yeah. You know, we got to look at those you know alternatives and figure out when our rates and and replacement schedule can align. Uh, we are also um, balancing this with very significant investments in water treatment. So those are something which. Uh, and Sven, you'll probably appreciate when we pull together the budget to give you the overview. This is somewhat in anticipation of what we expect. You know, we don't want great shock. We've got to be fa fairly realistic with what our projections are. And there's a lot of uncertainty right now in our treatment costs. And if those are can be managed or minimized, we'll be able to adjust this allocation for the. the I'm just concerned. Um... You're saying here Concord should replace two to three miles per year. We are going like shy of one mile per year on this. This is, this is the new guy. I'm used to the one and a half. But. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just perhaps like is I grew up in a town that was like, okay, the town was thousand years old, but <laughs> that it ran at a certain point to the, that more or less 50% of the pipes in the town were more than 100 years old, more or less within a five year time frame. Yeah. So it all snowballed mm -hmm. into a major kind of a disaster financially for the town. Yeah. So perhaps I'm personally too sensitive against. No, not at all. It's, it's it's a balance. Yeah. But it said if if we can figure out our water treatment issues, then we can sort of adjust the uh, schedule. The other challenge then we have is how much construction can we handle in town without uh, you know significant upset. Yeah. Um, so this this is a balance act, but no, you're not. Towards the town, you should definitely flag that that there's significant yeah. more investment needed. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and just highlight that this is snowballing. It's like if you put a mile to two miles a year down the road, it just adds up. Correct. Yeah. So after ten years, you're like twenty five miles That's behind. Right. That's right. And and <laughs> and and, uh, and that's been happening across the industry. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, paper after paper on the underinvestment in the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, right now, the real challenge is just the stability of the market and the materials and everything else, which is just adding to that. Uh, but you're right to, to call that, you know, it's, it's not something that we are, um, you know, shy about communicating. The former finance director, every year we had the same conversation. We were about $200,000 a year and, you know, that's not enough. They were we're getting there. Uh, the water replacement, water meter replacement, just to be aware of that we are working with municipal light plant on the new technology. It's taken a long time to launch this. Uh, in essence, they're putting new electric meters everywhere. We're just looking to tag along and use the same platform, but something that can sort of transmit water data from a meter to this uh, through a software into our billing system. Uh, and we are budgeting significantly over the next two years uh, for the labor and materials to do installations. Um, regrettably, 
we just learned that their schedule and needs don't align with the um, hours. So we're going to be independently trying to look at the the how we how we address water sewer, uh, regrettably independently. Maybe a different service provider. You know, having to go to the same house, but that's what we're being informed is you know likely the yeah where we where we need to take it. But we are looking at a, a significant investment over the next couple of years to do this upgrade. Um, I'm going to just go to what I think is important, you know, really on the treatment I'm side. Gonna, I'm going to ask you about hydrants. how long do hydrants last? Hydrants. What's the lifetime? All right. So a hydrant is a large valve that's exposed at the surface, right? Most people don't even understand that. They see a hydrant. It's literally a fancy valve, and it's it's readily accessible, and lots of water can flow from it. So it's kind of a combination of a pipe and valve all in one. Um, we have. Uh, Jeff, how many is it? 1500? It says 1200. 1200. Okay. 1200 uh, um, hydrants. They're similar in age to the water main. When you do a water main replacement program, you replace all of the hydrants as well. So anytime we do a replacement, those are included, but we don't wait for that. If a hydrant is inoperable, and a lot of the flushing we do, and sort of we go That's check the fine. hydrants. Okay. And so, um, a real problem, just like an old globe valve in your basement that's never operated, the one time you get operated, it's going to leak and it's going to be a problem. We do go around and exercise these and make sure they're operable. So, um, okay. Yeah. And sometimes they can be accidentally damaged during firefights as well. So, we'll routinely go out and inspect the hydrant afterwards just to make sure that it's still performing properly and hasn't been accidentally damaged. There's a lot of adrenaline when someone's fighting a fire and all hydrants in different communities don't open the same way. So, you know, it's something which we work with. But um, I, I really want to spend a little bit of time on uh, the uh, NAGOG pond improvements and, and basically give you a, a highlight of the fact that we know with NAGOG, it's been a priority for many, many years and went through a lot of years of design and permitting and then litigation. Mm -hmm. And um, at this point, we have entered sort of the perfect storm on top of when we're ready to go with, you know, proceeding with, uh, we looked at a new site in Concord. Uh, we were getting ready to just go full steam ahead. And then PFAS hit. And we've talked about PFAS being this sort of universal or, you know, sort of ubiquitous chemical at very, very, very low levels is identified as problematic and we realized that even nagog pond even though it's a well protected reservoir has uh pfos in it levels that are presently well below standards that exist but new information from epa is suggesting that those standards may change so we need to now include uh, pfos potential treatment that we hadn't anticipated but that's going to be you know um, built into our design. Uh, but we also realize we have other sources of supply that also have PFAS. PFAS is everywhere. And that has caused us a couple things to say, before we proceed with the NAGOG treatment, we want a better handle of what is the whole needs for long-term for the, for the town of Concord. Right now, we do not believe it's a good market to go out and bid and you know construct a treatment facility. It's just the uh, two. The market is too volatile, and uh, we are uh, putting that on a hold. Well, we do. We we take a, a a broader look at potential for regionalization of water supply. We've started conversations with MWRA. We're really looking at long term. Is there? an alternative to spending you know, 35, $40 million on one treatment facility, and then look at what else we have, is there potential of uh, maybe a regional solution working with MWRA? We know their source water quality has traces of PFAS, but the traces are much lower than what we see the standards you know, being discussed at EPA, and the standards of certain constituents of two to four parts per trillion. Right now it's at 20. And so it's we have to rethink this. This is a big, big um, challenge for Concord. It's a big challenge for the 
the region. You know, it, it, almost nobody is um, not touched by it. And because of that, we're talking to our neighboring communities who we believe are in similar situation of trying to make decisions on real time, how quickly they, do they advance with their own complex, expensive treatment facilities, a number of them in each community versus a wholesale getting a supply uh, from you know, MWRA. MWRA has gone out, they're working with the North Shore communities, they're working on the South Shore communities, they were actively working with them to look at regionalization. And we've talked with them about a, a Metro West alternative that is gaining more and more interest. Um, and we've had three or four conversations already but our interest is to get a better handle on, is that a viable alternative long-term? And then how do we build in NAGOG to that strategy? But it's just, we're at a, a point now, and this is only informed by information that came available in the spring, that we need to just take a, a, you know, a, a pause. And if we decide that we are gonna move forward with NAGOG, we've got money in our, our plan for uh, completion of the design, um, full-scale design in FY24. That's the game plan. It's, it's a lot of money. We're talking for NAGOG, $35, $40 million of, of a project. We went to town meeting back in 2016, I think for 16 and a half at that time, that was a probable cost estimate, but due to the delays, the litigation, and now where we are with the economy, we're at somewhere around $35, $40 million. So that's sobering. So is this a decision is. that's going to take a number of years to get to, or do you think it's within a year and a half? I'd say within a year, we'll have a sense of how, what direction, what direction we're going to head. And if we need to, you know, considerations could be, if we went regional, does, that, does NAGOG be, is that part of our solution? You know, there's okay. some systems are partially served by MWRA, some are completely served and we need to look at that. And then we have to do the cost benefit. Right. But that is the most, that's the most significant takeaway. The rest of these are you know, things that we deal with day in, day out. That's, that's more than unusual. This is kind of once in a lifetime sort of decision-making for Concord. And we'll make sure that we continue to keep the board, you know, the commission uh, aware of those activities. So if we went with the MWRA plan, we might still consider using NAGOG. And there could be a hybrid. Okay. And would that still mean that we would have to um, have the same construction costs? We would do the same plan. Okay. Yeah, but we would at least have a better sense of, okay, Very what are the, the real costs okay. over the next five, 10 years? That's what I'm thinking though. Would we still qualify for the low interest loans? Um, possible. Likely. Okay. Likely. Nothing would change as far as the importance within the state, but the SRF, that's the Clean Water Trust, is, is actually not, it, it, it's good to have a low interest loan now, especially before 2%, what is that? Well, if, if the market's six, then that has real value. Um, what we could hope for and what we're really looking to do is if we can get a regional interest and water supply solution, there's potential we could go federal funding you know, through a WIFIA, it's a different program where there could be, you know, sort of an interest in getting federal funds to help finance this, wouldn't just be conquered. Okay. So that's the most notable. I don't know if on the water side, if any have any questions, we'll then talk wastewater, but that was the most important thing I thought you should be aware of on the drinking water side. I, a while ago, I brought up the possibility of getting valves or pumps or whatever on a regional basis mm -hmm. you know, for, has anything ever come of that? Have you had a chance to see if other com communities would be interested? No, but we're, we've started the network and the conversation. So that, that can, you know, can be part of the, the discussion, but right now people are still kind of independently trying to figure out what they can do. We've set, we're set for the next year. You know, we've got our materials for um, our next project. Um, I think we're still trying to see how the supply demand shakes out. We're just, we're not on the other side of it. Um, but at this point, Jeff, I don't know if you're aware of any specific, you know, um, limitation with, with materials that you've seen. 
I'm not aware of any. Yeah. The electronics can be kind of a question mark sometimes in terms of components availability and backlogs of uh, receipt of materials. Um, hydrants haven't been all that bad in terms of uh, material backlog. Uh, we still had a fairly significant backlog for ductile iron pipe that kind of landed us into the predicament that we're in with the Barton Nut project. And we still haven't received our first shipment of pipe, uh, but we will, we, we've received hydrants, valves, fittings. The pipe is still brass, asking anyway. right? we, haven't, we haven't received the pipe yet. Yeah. Um, but we were anticipating receiving at least the first half of the pipe before the beginning of the project and the second half of the pipe um, a couple months into the project so that the project keep moving forward. Okay, I'm going to just also highlight the source uh, protection where we have a significant amount of money for planning. That's to help us with the integrated plan. That's to try and the contribution from the water fund of understanding some of this master planning we're talking about will be embedded there so we can track it. Um, we're also doing a feasibility study for potentially becoming a an MWRA yeah, that's part of that. supply community as a part of that effort. Yeah. Um, on the wastewater side, um, I think the, you know, Jeff, we might want to talk. Um, the thing that's notable at this point is probably looking at the needs of the wastewater treatment plant. It's reaching, uh, you know, 20, uh, 2007 is when we, uh, 2007 is when we did a full upgrade. So we're going through a facility plan this year and asset management plan next year um, to really help inform where you're going to spend the big money. Uh, we also have some components like the trickling filters that are these, it's this media that's used over at that facility. I don't know, it's at some point, if individually you have an interest in going over and taking a look, it's a pretty remarkable site. And it's hard to imagine sort of the scale of these things, but you know we have clarifiers and we have you know several buildings over there that are all part of this process and highly sophisticated uh, equipment, uh, which is why the, the costs are, are fairly significant. But the uh, the media for these trickling filters are, you know, what do we have? It's a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, for to replace them, and we've had them on our radar for some time because they've. They've, they've settled in their important process, but the trickling filter is an old technology that, you know, it's, it's a workhorse uh, for us, but that's the primary cost we have over, you know, I think for immediate, you know, work. We have a years. facility improvements line within the wastewater budget, and what's presented there is an asset management program development. We're hoping to have that largely funded by grants. We've got a grant application and we would need to have the uh, funding in place um, and approved by a town meeting in order to be eligible for that grant. So of, of that $180,000 that's earmarked for asset management, we'd be on the hook for, I believe, about 70,000 or in-kind match and the rest would be grant. And then the, the second piece of that same line item, professional services for treatment facility and designer services. What that intention is there, as Alan mentioned, we're, we're, we've already commenced a facility improvement plan, which is a, a long-term planning tool on what we actually need to do and when we need to do it for upgrades. The treatment facility, we're expecting to have that finalized by the end of this FY, so by the end of June of 23. So this set aside, the second piece is intended to address uh, designer services for the first improvement project that would fall under that facility plan. Uh, the second major line item, uh, wastewater treatment plant capacity and opti optimization. That's comprised of uh, two major pieces and I discussed both of them in the, the previous uh, presentation on the NIPTES permit, the first one being the anti-degradation analysis. We had an earmark of 150,000 for that. And then an update for the CWMP. And Alan said it's a, a very intensive process, but we had a set aside 
earmark for that of 200,000. So those two comprise that particular line item for 24. Those are things, the takeaways you should be aware of in any specific questions. You know, it's just, this is the first phase. We just submitted this packet to the town manager for her review and the finance director. They'll be talking with the finance you know, committee as well. And eventually we'll be pulling together our operating expense. Then we'll come back and talk a little bit about the, with a performer on how this looks, you know, once we start finalizing our budget. So it's more of information, uh, but you can see this is what drives, you know, a lot of the effort and the staff's involved with. Ready to move on? Yeah, you guys are, yeah. Scenic Roads Bylaw Regulation Update. Okay, so in essence on this item, and I'm looking at the clock and we're gonna be moving things with the director's report pretty quickly as well, but with the Scenic Road Bylaw, this was information. Um, there's been some back and forth with the planning uh, board. Uh, where they've got some feedback from the commission's, you know, first deliberation. Uh, we've got a draft, it was only last week, it was provided. So what we want to do is give the commission sufficient time to um, review it. We're not, you know, um, in a position to have any discussion, uh, deliberation tonight. Um, but I did want to say that as you review the packet, if you have questions, um or you know your thoughts share them with me directly not with a group i will then share them with staff i'll talk with planning what i can so that we can have a you know sort of you can have those opportunities to ask your questions and we can deliberate them and we'll have the opportunity to sort of do some of that legwork for you so um there is no um, um there was no plan to have a conversation there was a lot in there um but staff is still sort of chewing through it as well just so we can understand it. But I think what we want to do is just make sure you were aware of it. We put it on the docket so people are aware that you've got you know, this and it's a back and forth you know, where we need to provide the planning board with you know, certain recommendations. Once we get these, these regulations, you know, we're all gonna live with them and we're trying to make sure they, they make sense for you know, everyone. So I think that's sort of the, the, um, the approach uh, that we have. And again, if you have a question or a thought, please share it with me directly. You don't need to share it with the rest of the uh, commission. And I'll make sure that we get a response at the next meeting so we can have it as part of the discussion. Okay. okay. Excuse me, Andrea. Yes. Um, I hi. I meant to bring this up last meeting and we ran out of time. Um, it's it's kind of related, but a separate topic. But this whole scenic road bylaw obviously brought to our attention our roads policy and i was going to suggest to the commission if there was interest and in staff too if there's interest in looking at the roads policy and see if there's anything that should be updated in that and I, this is not being critical of it that is not the intent at all it's just it's relatively old and a lot of technology has changed changed and green infrastructure or in a number of new products on the market. And I think it might be worth us looking at our policy and see if there's anything that should be updated to make sure we're addressing current standards and uh, stormwater treatment and things like that. I don't know if anybody else has, has any comment on that or thinks it's a good idea, but I was going to put it out there for the commission to think about and Maybe we bring it up at a future meeting to see if we want to do a deeper dive on it. Seems like it might be worth it. I think that's a really good suggestion. Okay. So maybe we can add that at some point in the future, Alan, when it's yeah, I think appropriate it's good, time to bring it up. It's a good idea to sort of make sure that the regulations and the road policy do sync, you know, so yep. good time to at least have it on our radar. I don't know. Schedule wise can be driven by the commission as far as what you think is appropriate, but we'll staff will start thinking about that, Jeff. Okay, thanks. I, I would like to just point out that the proponents of the bylaw when presented at town meeting did advocate for collaboration and communication between town staff, pub, which included pub, public works and the historic commission and um, and the planning board. So I think that like that open communication collaboration 
sharing ideas and trying to pinpoint problems that may arise in the implementation of this is really important. So when we do discuss it next time to have that those issues on our radar, I think addressing them ahead of time before we're in the middle of a big project is important. And I hope that everyone involved is willing to listen to all of those suggestions. Great. Okay, excellent. All right. Director's report. We ready to move on? Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm going to ask staff that if you uh, you have a maximum five minutes, but less is preferred. Okay, only because we're trying to make sure we can keep people on schedule. I'm going to share the screen. If I can get things back up here. On the, uh, okay. There we go. All right. So, um, Steve Dukran, uh, town engineer, welcome to the table. Uh, we'll start off with an engineering update. Okay. I haven't said a word yet, so I'm going to take my full five minutes. <laughs> um, we start with the, the paving program, the roads program. Last week, we did the last of the major work on our streets, Autumn Lane, uh, Stacy Circle, Pheasant Lane, and um, one I'm missing, but anyway, um, we didn't just to let you know we we didn't get everything that we had planned for this year done for a variety of reasons, costs being one of those very high costs coming in our bids, as well as uh, trying to get contractors to do the work. It's been so difficult, and as well as delays by national grid, not getting streets yeah usually work done ahead of us. So we, we plan on getting all of those completed next year, as well as the additional streets that we are going to be scheduling for next year. And we will bring those to you in the de December meeting. All right, here, um, hmm. showing up. Okay, let me um, stop sharing quickly. See if I can't regenerate this. I don't know what happened there, but let me, uh, one second. Steve, you can uh, you can yeah uh, explain. I think bit. the next slide is about um, the microsurfacing on Hildreth Lane. Um, at the meeting last time, the, the microsurfacing just started, and so in the next couple of days after the meeting, we had a second layer installed, and uh, it's an, we were able to control the traffic better. So. Uh, with that and the curing over time, um, it's looking better and better every day. As promised by the contractor, uh, it needs traffic to really smooth out the roughness and the, and the appearance. And I think we also showed um, <clears throat> a slide with uh, drainage work on Commonwealth Ave. We had a, a, a rain event not too long ago and it caused some flooding um, on Com Ave and in that general area. And after some investigation, we found out that it was due to a broken drain pipe that was uh, caused by laying a, a water service to the Neshoba Brook Bakery. So we got a contractor who had done the initial work to come back and do the, and complete the repair. So that's that's um, functioning. In, in, okay, um, I, I think I might be able to apologize, Steve. I don't know, it had to regenerate. Um, let me just make sure when I share, it comes up. Air. Are we there? Okay. Okay. So that's that. Hildred. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Sorry, we'll cover that. You can move on to that. the next yep. one. And we talked about that. So the last one, yeah. Oh, Monument Street. So this area is where we did a culvert repair, the major culvert repair last year, and we came back. There was some drainage to be um, worked on, so that was completed, and then the area that was disturbed during the culvert work was melt out and paved so it's in looking good out there all right so we still have some cleanup work uh, um left in the season uh, the weather is helping us we have a lot of people still paving out there you go through some towns there are uh, um on borrow time but we're taking it, that opportunity to do that yeah, and we have a hard stop generally on november 15th for right of way work because you just never know. And so a lot of the contractors are conditioned to understand it's, it's a firm stop and weather can change quickly. I mean, we've been pretty fortunate lately, 
but you know the winter is is close by. Close by. Uh, Aaron, if uh, you want to come up and just give, give a brief, or I'd say very brief overview of some of the other highway ground activities. Yes. Thank you, Aaron McLosco, Highway and Ground Superintendent. First photo: um, fall season cleanup. Uh, from downtown, uh, crews are active, uh, actively out cleaning up open spaces, uh, remove a lot of the lead debris uh, that's accumulated and um, transport it to the compost site on, on Walden Street. Uh, this is an example. Uh, you'll see in the capital plan, we have uh, earmarked uh, some funding for the Doug White turf field replacement. Um, uh, the field's kind of exceeded its replacement schedule, if you will. Um, uh, this is a typical uh, damage report that we'll receive from the users of the field. Um, Concord Public Works maintains that complex and we will perform small repairs in house uh, uh, by kind of um, repairing the turf. Uh, sometimes re repairs are, or require more extensive work and we'll have to contract that out. Um, to, but this is, I want to include this as a, a recent um, damage report that we'd received. Crews are preparing for winter maintenance. Uh, floor on the left uh, is an employee painting uh, one of the wing plows. Uh, and employees on the right, that was a sander training um, that we had uh, the vendor uh, from Sears Controls come in, work with our operators, of new operators, train them on how to operate uh, the electronic controls on the sanders. And that's an example of uh, calibrating one of the machines. Uh, we had the drop-off swap-off event um, last month, um, very successful, uh, very well attended. Uh, event here at, at the campus. This is a photo of the line of cars kind of entering and out here. Uh, a lot of go effort goes into uh, planning. I work closely with the Reusic group. It's a, a local um, uh, a group in town of residents that are very interested in recycling um, and solid waste. And, um, you know, they coordinate all the volunteer efforts to do a great job, a great group of folks uh, uh, to work with. And um, this is a photo of kind of the swap off area right out here where, where folks could could bring items to be swapped off uh, in exchange for other items. A uh, photo of one of our bays. Um, so the event takes over our entire campus. We have to remove all of our equipment um, out of this facility, essentially off site. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, game of Tetris out back trying to trying to so make room. Uh, this is an example. Usually these bays are, are filled with equipment and trucks, and right now they're filled with batteries and styrofoam. Um, uh, photos of some of the CPW staff that uh, you know dedicated uh, a full day plus to, the, to attending on a Saturday here um, and, and making it happen. So I wanted to highlight their their participation in the in the event and uh, thank them for the dedicated service to the town and the department. And as Aaron mentioned, a lot of volunteers really sort of help out, make this work, and really enjoy the day. And the, the weather was just fantastic. It was just a perfect day. Uh, and just wanted to highlight that as of November 1st this year, MassDP has added mattresses and textiles to the list of materials banned from disposable or transport for disposal in Massachusetts. Uh, so in anticipation of this, the town to work closely with MassDEP to receive a grant for that Connex box in the middle photo. Uh, where we have a program that uh, residents can bring down uh, a mattress um, they, uh, by coordinate, by calling the office, solid waste recycling. They can purchase uh, basically the same tags you use for bag tags for curbside recycling program, slap the tags on the, on the mattress, bring the mattress down. Uh, and residents have to remove their own mattress from their own motor vehicle. Staff will not touch a mattress and they have to place a mattress in the Connex box. When the box is full, we contact the vendor. They come and take the box, empty it, disposal facility, and then bring us back the Connex container. Uh, and then there's also textile recycling options available. It's an example of the container at the Willard School. We have a number of those um, the town school facilities throughout town where residents, no charge, can recycle textile materials. And this initiative got a lot of uh, press, you know, uh, statewide. You know, um, so Concord's not unique, but we, at least we had a program in place and already started managing it. A little bit ahead of the curve. Um, Aaron, thank, thank you very you. much. Jeff, if you want to come back and wrap it up? We will then. Last water two slides. Slides. Yeah, last two slides. Uh, this first slide is a uh, follow up on our Nagog Pond intake. Um, we had previously pursued the replacement of the intake. The intake piping is in excess of 100 years old. This was at one point the primary drinking water source for the town. Uh, what we ended up 
contracting with environmental partners to do the design of what's we're calling phase two of the intake replacement. And it was advertised, publicly advertised for bidding on September 22nd. Bids were received on October 19th. And it was, uh, in fact, only one bidder that had submitted a bid for that project. And it happened to be the same contractor we contracted with for the first <laughs> half of the project. Um, so the, the bid and references, bid review and references was undertaken by environmental partners and they made a recommendation to the town. Uh, that was on October 21st, we received that from EP and the town has reviewed EP's recommendation and is now pursuing town approval to make the award of the construction contract and the execution of this construction contract so that it can move to construction. The goal is for this project to be completed before the beginning of the demand season where we'd be looking to draw upon Nagog Pond to offset the peak demand that occurs in the warm weather months. Um, unless this goes off perfectly without a hitch, we may be contemplating a, uh, a water ban at the beginning of the demand season as a protective measure, uh, but we'll speak more to that as uh, the coming months uh, in successive meetings with the commission. Uh, last slide, we touched on this um, having to do with the, the work with uh, MWRA and uh, Kleinfelder was doing, Kleinfelder, the engineer was doing work for the town for the integrated water management plan. And as a task within that contract, we um, are having Kleinfelder do a feasibility study analysis for prospectively becoming water supplied by MWRA. And one of the first tasks in this is to develop a hydraulic model of the distribution system. Um, I would mention just as a background unrelated, but similar we had had in the mid mid month of October, we were doing our routine uh, flushing program. And this was taking place during the daytime hours. And it was the Western portion of the town that we were working on for this particular flushing round. But it was at the very tail end of October, uh, October 31st, November 1st, November 2nd, we were doing these fire flow tests and these were being conducted in the overnight. And this was uh, Kleinfelder working together with our town staff. And we were getting measurements on flows and pressures at 22 different locations throughout the town, throughout the distribution system that'll provide the uh, data that Kleinfelder needs to build the hydraulic model. So that work is um, in progress. The, the fire flows are completed at this point. I think we're good. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the commissioners? No, no. Okay. Yes, any public comment? Uh, I see. Pam Hell. Yep. Let Pam Hell. Just we got to make sure we can unmute people. Pam, are you unmuted? Yeah, there I you go. think I am. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I just a comment. I wasn't able to see any of your screen shares, so maybe that was just me, but I don't know if anybody else had that problem. So, uh, so whatever. Um, I'm just call. I'm just um, speaking up to uh, see if there was any uh, inspection or progress made on the chip seal uh, pavement experiment on a Nursnack Hill. Steve Dukner, do you want to speak to where we are with the? This is part of the piloting that we've talked about in the past and some of the treatments. Yeah, Steve Dukin, town engineer. Um, we have inspected the street. With, um, my staff has gone out there and they've looked at the locations. Uh, there, it appears that the, 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 the street's getting better with traffic. Um, the, the complaints about the edges being broken, uh, that has, we believe, we. That, that has little to do with the condition of the street um, pavement that uh, we will have to have a separate effort to uh, maintain those edges. 
Um, but we do want to give the chip seal uh, a winter uh, to to um, to have the snow plows, and uh, as as indicated by the contractor, if you if it's snow plowing and the time um, for several months should get us a better improved surface. So we we do want to to have to give it a, a try, and if at the end of the winter season and say spring, if um, if the conditions have improved to our satisfaction, uh, we would look at doing it, uh, probably a microsurfacing on it, um, we, which we did on Hildred. So we are monitoring that as well to see how that performs. In, um, if, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, is there a way that uh, the town could use a street cleaner or something to remove all of the chips in the walking areas? Aaron, you, yeah, I think we did have some sweeping done the last. Yeah, we can go back up to the yeah so um, yeah, Pam, the question is, uh, can we get a street sweeper up there again? Um, the answer is yes. You know, we'll sort of, Aaron, you've been doing some planned maintenance around town. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, street, we're uh, doing our seasonal fall street sweeping, uh, cleaning up leaf debris, so we'll be up there. Okay. So you'll be up there in the next couple of weeks. That would be great if the, uh, they could pay particular attention to the side, the roadside. And we Thank do you. have some um, uh, shoulder restoration uh, planned for next week up at Nurse Neck Hill as well. I've been working with Justin Richardson on that post inspection. So. I'm sorry, Aaron, I don't know if people can hear you. Aaron mentioned uh, that there is some uh, shoulder restoration uh, efforts that their highway grounds is gonna be looking at and performing in the Nurse Neck Hill neighborhood next week. next week. Okay. So you may, uh, Pam, you may see some um, some improvements on the uh, shoulders uh, from some uh, highway grounds uh, work next week. Okay. If they need any input on where the worst areas are, I'd be happy to. And we even noticed that at different areas on a Nursnack Hill Road, the chip seal is in better condition than others. And we wonder if they got the mix wrong or something. Uh, from our house to um, Wits End, if they, if that, because that is particularly crumbly in that area. Yep. Okay. And part of the pilot will be, uh, you know, there's all eyes are on it because we're all equally interested to understand its, you know, impact over, we, we anticipate it over season and we're going to see what happens in the spring, but we'll keep an eye on that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Doesn't look like it. Do you see anyone? Don't see anybody, no. I move we adjourn. Second. All right. So I uh, roll call of commissioners. So Andy Salmon, aye. Jeff Fasser. Aye. Sven Weber. Aye. James Terry. Aye. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Wow. Five minutes early.